Sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern. Your Peloton treadmill may be dangerous to your health. Lumber is dangerous to your wallet. Bitcoin takes a dive. And Warren Buffett. All that and more tonight on Wall Street Wrap-Up. And welcome to Wall Street Wrap-Up and hope your week went well. I'm Andre Laborde. Our goal is bringing Wall Street to your street for today, Friday, April the 23rd, 2021. And to get you ready for the events ahead for next week. We'll also be talking with author Robert Hagstrom. He's about to, just wrote a new book on Warren Buffett. And in just a moment, we'll be talking with him. But first, how did the markets do this week? The Dow Jones Industrial Average ended the week at 34,043, up 227 points for the day and down about a half a percent for the week. And the S&P 500 closed today at 4,180, up 45 points for the day and down 13 points of 1% for the week. And finally, the NASDAQ. They finished the week at 14,016, up 198 points for the day and down about a quarter of a percent for the week. The Dow Jones, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ had their best day since April the 5th. All the sectors rebounded from Thursday's sell-off, but the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ posted weekly losses. And Bitcoin? Well, that dropped 17.5% this week to just under $51,000. So let's get to our guest tonight. Robert Hagstrom has over 30 years of investment experience as Chief Information Officer at Equity Compass Financial, and he's the author of over 10 books on investing, including his latest, Warren Buffett, The Ultimate Money Mind. Robert, welcome to the St Wall Street Wrap-Up, and, and tell us, Robert, why is Warren Buffett such an interesting character? Well, you know, if you think about all the people, celebrities that have been managing money, uh, I can't think of one has done it as long as he has. He started managing money in the 1950s uh, and has been such a positive role model for investors for now going on 70 years. And uh, he truly is a remarkable individual, positive, humble, humorous, fun to be with. Uh, you just couldn't ask for a better package. And so also somebody that really never went to New, uh, well, never moved his offices to New York or Los Angeles or Chicago, but he's been in Omaha and he's still in the same house since 1958, and I don't think he's going to be moving now either. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I think he's I think he's pretty set there. Born and raised in Omaha, you know, it, it's his, you know, he loves his hometown. He was in New York for a couple of years when he studied with Ben Graham at Columbia University, but he didn't put roots down. And as soon as he finished his education and some time managing money with Ben Graham, he hustled back to Omaha. Bought this house, I think it was 1956, you're close, uh, and has never moved since 1956. I think the only addition, Andre, he put a handball court on his property so he could get some exercise. Other than that, he hasn't made any changes. I to that now, I read, I read your other book, the, the Warren Buffett Way, and this new book is called uh, The Ultimate, the Ultimate uh, Money Mind. What made you decide on, on writing this new book about Warren Buffett, The Ultimate Money Mind? It was a humbling confession, Andre. I mean, you know, I, I wrote The Warren Buffett Way in, in 1994. Uh, it became a New York Times bestseller. Uh, it's now in its third edition, uh, you know, well over a million copies, translated into 18 foreign languages. Uh, soon after, I wrote a book uh, on portfolio management called The Warren Buffett Portfolio. And you would think after all of that, Andre, you know, I would have it figured out. But it was at the 2017 annual meeting that Warren began to talk about a concept called the money mind, and, and it had to do with temperament and thinking about things. And, and I thought to myself, you know, you spent the last 25 years figuring out mechanics, uh, the methods, everything about how to swing the bat, but you never really studied the influences on his temperament, his philosophy. And so as we dug into the concept of money mind, you know, I embarrassingly said, you know, I think I discounted half the most important information that you need to have as, to be a successful mm -hmm. investor. 
the FOMO, fear of missing out, or the, as you just mentioned, the temperament of going just buy your yeah. company and put it on the side, your companies of stocks, you know, and put it on the side and not yeah. worry about it. Is it harder today, you think? His mentor, Ben Graham, said, you know, investing is easier than you think, harder than it looks. And Warren has repeated that over and over. And, and I, I thought I had it right. The easier than you think part is that you really don't have to become obsessed about worrying about the stock market is going up or down, worrying about the economy. Is it growing? Is it slowing? Is our interest rates rising and falling? And, 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 and as you well know, Andre, and, and being in this business, we just spend so much time talking about that. And Warren said, you know, you don't need to worry about any of that. That's not important. It's, if you're a business owner and you bought a business, all those things are not going to matter to you. The harder than it looks part is exactly what stumbles people, which is temperament. The ability, I think, to, you know, to put on uh, mental blockers uh, and, and not become so obsessed about the market going up and down. If it's going up, I feel great. If it's going down, I feel bad. The, the interesting thing about Warren Buffett is as central and celebrity as he is about the stock market, and everybody thinks about Warren Buffett and thinks about the stock market. And I'm curious if whether or not, he, does he even have that on? Does he even know that what the price of his Apple or the price of his Coca-Cola is going at that moment? Well, you know, I heard, uh, you know, I've heard the tales that he does have a TV in his office. It's a very simple office. Uh, and he occasionally has it on various financial news networks, but he turns the sound <laughs> off. You know, that's a, that also it. is a very wise thing, thing to do because <laughs> yeah. of the talking heads. And, and, and the only thing, you know, and I said, well, why does he have it on? And then he said, well, if it's a breaking news item on a company that he may be interested in or something that he owns and he sees it flash across the screen, you know, he may turn up the volume, but the rest of the time, if the, if the TV's on his office, it's, it's on without the sound being on, which is probably a pretty good thing to do. You talk about the power of compounding. That is sounds is so yeah. simple, but most people don't understand it that much. What is the power of compounding? Well, it, you know, it, it, it starts out slowly, Andre. You know, you don't really, I think, and, you know, you don't really kind of think about how powerful it is in its earliest stages of compounding. But as time goes by and you begin to compound year after year, bigger and bigger numbers, it really can become substantial. So think about it this way. If you're a stock trader and you're looking to make money, you're basically buying and selling all the time to try to make a profit uh, from your buying and selling. There's not a lot of compounding going on there. Uh, you're basically just doing short-term trading. But if you're a business owner and you are and your net worth is going to go up with the intrinsic value of the business that you own, that's the compounding effect of the intrinsic value growing from the underlying business that occurs over time. And so, you know, like, a, you know, it may be up 15 percent this year and another 15 to 20 percent next year. It may not seem a lot alike to you, but when you start doubling money about every five years and you double it then again in the next five years and you double it again in the next five years and the numbers keep getting bigger and bigger, it's just quite amazing the amount of money that you can earn by compounding interest or compounding the intrinsic value of your business. You are the chief information officer for Equity Compass uh, financial firm, but publicly traded companies, financial firms, are we're all graded. We're graded uh, by monthly, by our, our statements that we send out to clients, or of our quarterly reports. But is in, a, in Warren Buffett's thinking, uh, he may not buy a company that may not show a profit for a year, two years, quite possibly even longer. Uh, how hard is it for, for CEOs that always know that they have another quarter coming up? Warren has spoken, Andre, about this extensively, and he believes this, you know, be, becoming enslaved mm -hmm having to always report the next quarter profit uh, keeps you from actually making smart investments over the long term that actually can do you much better if you're willing to give up short-term profits for the quarter to make good, solid, long-term investments over time that will work better for your intrinsic value growth. He doesn't understand why a CEO wouldn't do that. Now, what we know is that the market uh, has a tendency that if you, if you beat your number and your, your number's higher than the market's expectation, your stock price goes up. If you don't beat the number, your stock price goes down. But that's all very short-term noise. 
And, and Warren doesn't believe that that does any good for the long-term growth of the intrinsic value of the business. So he doesn't play that game. He doesn't give out guidance on earnings. He doesn't care what the company does from quarter to quarter. His, uh, his investment horizon is much longer than the average investor. He's thinking about what investments do I make today that can pay off three, five, ten years from now. Most CEOs are making investments to what can pay off over the next three, five, ten months. He followed Benjamin Graham for a while. Then he went with Phil Fisher, um, another uh, well-known investor that was somewhat different on Benjamin Graham's thinking. And then now he'll buy companies that not always would Benjamin Graham would approve of where they're not at such a low-valued type of company. You, you've hit on a central point of his success because you could not have been successful for 70 years had you not been pragmatic in your thinking and always moved to what was working. So, by example, when he worked with Ben Graham and in the earliest years of his Buffett partnership from 1956 to 1969, he used the classic value investing methodology of low price earnings, low price to book, buying assets on the here and now and trying to get them at a big discount. And that worked for a pretty good period of time. When he took over Berkshire Hathaway and, and moved it from a one line uh, you know, textile business to a, now a, a conglomerate that had multiple businesses, uh, he began to think about the compounding effect. And so it was no longer a game about buying and selling hard asset businesses at discount. It was buying good businesses that could compound intrinsic value. And he learned that not only from Phil Fisher, who had written a book called Common Stocks, Uncommon Profits in 1958 that Warren read and had a great deal of influence on him, but from his long-term partner, Charlie Munger, who had basically geared him to think about, hey, why don't we buy a better business at a fair price and let that compound as opposed to buying a mediocre to bad business at a cheap price we just always have to sell those and get rid of them and move on. So it was a combination of Phil Fisher and Charlie Munger that moved him from what I called in the book uh, the phase one uh, value investing to phase two, buying better businesses that had cash flow. And then phase three, it's amazing that Warren, uh, at his age when he did, you know, made a multi-billion dollar investment in Apple. Apple is a phenomenal company, but it's more geared towards the technological revolution of network economics, and he's moved on to there. So imagine a guy that started in the 50s buying textile companies and, 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 and very boring businesses that, that then began buying newspapers and consumer durables uh, like Coca-Cola, consumer staples businesses, and then in his 80s, buying a company like Apple Computer, which is a network economics business, total, totally different economics. And, and paid a hundred million yeah, dollars. I was off, kind of know? surprised on that because he always said, Robert, that he only invests in things he understands, and he doesn't understand technology. Always made it made it uh, very well known. But he started buying Apple. Do you think it was either his um, his two lieutenants, Todd and um, I think Ted Ted Combs and Todd. Uh, were the ones yeah. that maybe started him into that, and then he went into it? Or I think I read one time, was it one of his grandchildren that was talking about always having an iPhone? I, th I think it was probably a combination of both. I, I think, though, that Warren, you know, basically said, you know, I don't make, you know, decisions immediately about, you know, whether one person says this or another person says that. He was able to think about it over time. And, and he came to, a, a, I think, a conclusion on two levels. First of the level was, that this was a, a product, very simple product, not unlike Coca-Cola, that people just coveted. They wanted to, they wanted their Apple phone, and they wouldn't give it up for another product. Uh, and there's many reasons why that 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 occurs in network economics. But it, it was a, it was almost people had thought when Warren bought Apple, he was buying Nokia or Motorola, and they said, well, you know, those are not great long-term investments. But he, but. But Apple was never Nokia or, or Motorola. Apple was the Louis Vuitton of yeah. cell phones. This was a great phone that people coveted, and uh, they couldn't do without it. Whether you're 80 years old or eight years old, you don't give up your right. Apple. And I've also, and then on top of that, he learned, you know, he learned about the network economics and the compounding of economics. So it took him to the next level, that third level. I've also value. known where people may go from Samsung to Apple, but I don't know many that go from Apple back to Samsung. <laughs> so. <laughs> Maybe for Maybe. doing that. We're going to, Robert, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. We're, we're talking with Robert Hagstrom. He's the chief information officer of Compass Equity, but also he's the author of 10 books on investments. And his latest book is Warren Buffett, The Ultimate Money Mind. We'll be right back 
right after this. We're back right now with Robert Hagstrom. And Robert, you brought up a little while ago before we before we went into a break about Charlie Munger. And I guess you can't talk about Warren Buffett without talking about Charlie Munger. How influential is Charlie? Warren had spent more time with Charlie Munger than he did with his dad, who you know had had, had tremendous influence on his thinking, uh, as well as Ben Graham, who was his mentor that taught him about value investing and security analysis. He's been with Charlie Munger now, you know, close to, you know, no, known Charlie Munger for close to 70 years. And, and they've been partners in Berkshire Hathaway going on, you know, close to 50 years now. So, yeah, Charlie is the right-hand man, the co-pilot. Uh, there's not much that Warren would do without bouncing ideas off of Charlie. Uh, but pretty much at the end of the day, that final decision is made by Warren. Uh, Charlie may agree or disagree, as he has in the past, about certain investments. But Warren will always debrief and, and share his thoughts about an investment. But at the end of the day, make no mistake, uh, the, the trigger's pulled by Warren Buffett. Uh, it's his company. He's the CEO. He makes the final Well, I know decision. one thing when it comes to Charlie Munger. If you ask him a question, he'll tell you, and he'll do it without the varnish. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, he's, um, he's pretty blunt in his assessment, and you don't have to read between the lines. He loves bridge. And in fact, he even said that yeah. he wouldn't mind going to jail if he knew his other two cellmates were bridge players, that that's how much he enjoys it. <laughs> well, I started thinking about it, and I know in the hedge fund world, Steve Cohen and David Einhorn are huge hedge funders. Well, they're also huge poker players. And Sir John Templeton, who had the Templeton funds, I also knew that in the 30s or the early, late 30s or early 1940s, to put himself through college, he was a poker player. Um, we had uh, Mario Gabelli as a guest just a few weeks back, and I know he was a, he's a huge card player. What is it about, and now Warren Buffett, huge which bridge, what is it about card playing? Does it have a similarity with investing? Warren is a sportsman, and, and, and playing bridge is, is a sports game, and as much as investing is a sports game. The commonalities about playing, whether you're playing bridge or poker, is that it's a game of probability. Uh, you have incomplete information, but just enough information uh, that you could draw some sense of a probability outcome in your mind and then bet accordingly. And, and, and think about investing. We don't have all the information, but we have just enough information to make a probability bet. Then you ultimately have to make the decision. So it's a game of probabilities and decision making. It dovetails right into the whole aspect of investing. I think that's why he loves playing bridge. It's so 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 similar to what investing. What about it in today's world? You again, you, you turn on the, um, the the financial shows and you hear different kinds of investing, such as ESG, which is environmental, socially accepted, and government types of funding. Uh, you also hear about now all the cryptocurrencies, and and today you've got these financial um, uh, companies like BlackRock that. That if you're the CEO of a company and you get a call from Larry Flink, uh, Larry Fink, the CEO, you will take that call because he has that much. Does Warren look really that much into the ESGs or other types of ways of investing? No, I think, you know, at the end of the day, he is in the most simple way. He's just a business owner. He's just saying, what business do I want to own? What business generates cash? Uh, it's highly predictable, run by good, solid management who are rational, who allocate capital. And how long can this business continue to be run this way? Things that are hard and difficult for him, as he says, lie outside his circle of confidence, which might be you know, the cryptocurrencies and the SPACs, the special purchase acquisition companies, things like things that are outside his circle of confidence. He doesn't even bother with it. It's OK with him that other people want to play that game. He just plays the game where he has the competitive advantage, where he has the insight, where he's strongest in the card game. Those are the games that he wants to play, and that's what he focuses on. What about when it comes to, uh, I'm thinking about companies that such as like, I, I was so sad when, like when Sears, Sears and Roebuck went out of business, would he ever get involved with something like Amazon.com 
or a company such as that? Well, he did actually own the Amazon bonds uh, many, many years ago when they got very cheap. He had such high regard for Jeff Bezos and said at the annual meeting, he said he might be one of the greatest uh, entrepreneurs who, who ever lived. He says, you know, it's one thing to build a, a, a business that becomes the global leader. But Jeff did it twice. He did it with online retailing, and now he's done it with, you know, cloud computing with AWS, Amazon Web Services. Has very, very high regard for Jeff. Um, I know that uh, Ted basically had made a, or it might have been Todd, excuse me, had made an investment in Amazon a couple of years ago. But as far as we know, there hasn't been any, uh, it was a billion dollar type investment. As far as we know, there hasn't been any additional investment in Amazon. But, and he admitted, you know, he admitted that he made the mistake. He missed it. He said he had missed Google. I should have bought Google. Uh, but then, uh, as Charlie Munger said, he made it up by investing in Apple and made, you know, uh, just tens of millions, tens of billions of dollars investing in Apple. So, you know, that, 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 that was his, uh, you know, I'm sorry I missed Amazon. I'm sorry I missed Google, but at least I got Apple. And so made true. A lot of money. With the last remaining seconds we've got, tell me a little bit about his, his tolerance for risk. Um, and I'm thinking about just recently, uh, we in February had Texas had a huge snowstorm that knocked out a lot. Well, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Warren Buffett, I know, is uh, talking to the Texas legislature about he's willing to invest $8 billion for a 9% return, annual return, but he will guarantee with his insurance companies that Texans will not go without utilities again. Well, I mean, it may be fine for the next year, two years, or it may be 30 years before something like that ever happens again, if any. So what is his tolerance for risk? Well, he has a very high tolerance for, for risk as long as he's paid for it. If, 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 if in the insurance business, I'll insure pretty much anything if I get the premium that makes it worth taking the risk. And I'm sure he did the calculation with the Texas utilities. A 9% return, guaranteed return, um, that he can use in order to build out the infrastructure there that no one would have a utility problem down the road. Uh, it, it's a pretty good investment return, a pretty good premium, I should say, that he could write the insurance against that. So Warren, you know, investing and writing insurance premiums are so closely correlated. To that, I would also point out Ajit Jan, who runs National Indemnity and always does all these large super cat reinsurance policies, one of the smartest uh, betters, I guess, if you would say, someone who understands risk, but understands how to get paid for taking risks. Warren's not afraid to take risks. He just wants to be paid. I understand. Robert, I got a lot more time, a lot more questions, but unfortunately, the clock doesn't stop. Warren Buffett, the ultimate money mind. Thanks a lot, Robert. Appreciate it. Also in the news this week, for the second straight week, Americans filing for jobless benefits declined to 547,000 workers. Now, that's a new low since lockdowns began last March due to COVID fears. Initial unemployment claims, which is a proxy for layoffs, fell 39,000 last week, according to the Labor Department. And jobless claims are still higher than their pre-pandemic levels prior to March 2020. Now, this weekly average of jobless claims in 2019 was 218,000. But the numbers released this week shows a downward trend since the start of the year, and it's raising expectations for the rest of 2021. Employers across the country say that they're in need of workers, but the additional weekly federal unemployment payments given as well as state unemployment payments, uh, employers are having to be creative in offering incentives such as bonuses, raises, and other ways to hire more workers. And this week, the Consumer Product Safety Commission issued warnings for the Peloton Tread Plus treadmill and said it should not be used around small children or pets because they could get trapped underneath the machine. Peloton is pushing back against the report, calling it inaccurate and misleading. Peloton said there's no reason to stop using the Tread Plus treadmill as long as warnings and safety instructions are followed. And we'll be back right after this. And the price of lumber is going through the roof. Well, pardon the pun, but certain types of material are skyrocketing. And if you've been one of the many who are during these lockdown times of wanting to either remodel your existing home or possibly purchase a new one and had sticker shock, well, you're not 
you're not alone. The jump in lumber prices has added more than $24,000 to the average cost of building a new single-family home, which now stands at $315,000 on average. Now, this has not translated to the growers of trees that produce the product. Now, there's an abundance of harvest-ready trees in the South, and the bottleneck is in the sawmills. You, you may have one time heard the saying, money doesn't grow on trees, but it presently does in the sawmills. Well, if you've got a question about finance or a comment, we'd love to hear about the show, and we'd love to hear from you. You can write us at Andre at Wall Street Wrap Up. Dot info. Keep it pithy or concise, and we'd be glad to answer your questions. And now for a look ahead for next week. But first, well, this well-known intellect, he didn't speak until he was four years old, and he didn't know how to read until he was seven. His parents thought he was subnormal, and one of his teachers described him as mentally slow, unsociable, and adrift. He was expelled from school, and he was refused admittance to the Zurich Polytechnic School. Who was he? We'll have the answer in just a minute. Stay tuned. Well, this well-known intellect, he didn't speak until he was four years old, and he didn't read until he was seven. His parents thought he was subnormal, and one of his teachers described him as mentally slow, unsociable, and adrift. He was expelled from school and was refused admittance to the Zurich Polytechnical School. Who was he? The answer, Albert Einstein. Well, a new study finds middle-aged adults who sleep six or fewer hours a night may be at a higher risk of developing dementia in later life. The study suggests those 50 years of age and older who sleep six hours a night or less have a 22% higher risk of developing dementia in later life. 60-year-olds were at a higher risk of 37% more likely to get the disorder. And past research also suggested that obesity, higher systolic blood pressure, and mental health issues like depression can increase the risk of sleep issues and dementia. The study in the UK was over a 25-year span. And finally, this week, a new survey by Pew said that 60% of U.S. adults now support legalized recreational use of marijuana, and an additional 31% back medical marijuana usage, and save you for a trip to the calculator, that leaves just 9% of adults who oppose legalized marijuana. With poll numbers as this, that's why more politicians are backing the legalization. And this month, New Mexico became the 17th state to allow recreational use. Well, join me next week when my guest will be Greg McCullough and Richard Bodsky, the co-managers of the $8 billion Putnam Growth Opportunities Fund. They've brought the firm some spectacular returns, and they'll be here next week. Well, that's our show. Hope you've enjoyed it. And we'll see you next for this Friday, April the 23rd. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook and WYES.org. So thank you for joining us for Wall Street Wrap-Up. I'm Andre Laborde. Remember, money never sleeps. Good night. Sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern.